My god, we're finally here, everyone. I'm not at the end end at the Kingdom Hearts marathon yet, I still have fragmentary passage to go, but this is the Kingdom Hearts game in the series that everyone called me insane for not doing before Dream Drop Distance, even though that comes out after all the games chronologically, and I was playing chronologically and going back to the prequels after, and it shouldn't have mattered, but it clearly did because the story writers were just making shit up as they went along with the game order releases instead of the chronological order, yay! Birth by Sleep was released in 2010 on the PSP for yet another console to add to the ever-growing list of who gives a shit that was eventually re-released on the PS4 collections alongside one, two, three, five, eight days, etc., and actually appears as the final game on that PS4 disc. That, as I've discovered, is for good reason as well, since so much of the plot of Dream Drop Distance, despite it being the most recent chronologically and follows straight after Coded, does take a lot of Birth by Sleep's cues for its story. So I know it's a bit late now, but if you're going into this series, I highly recommend that you play Birth by Sleep before Dream Drop, unless you like a lot of mystery that needs solving by playing prequels afterwards. Luckily, after playing this game, I'm not that lost anymore. All of my questions were answered, and I'm glad that I got to this game too, because Birth by Sleep is now my second second favourite Kingdom Hearts game behind Kingdom Hearts 2. Why is that? Well, we've got a bit of story to go over first, so here's your warning for today. Spoilers are right, okay, nice. <laughs> Okay, so many years after X-Key Crossback Cover and the Keyblade War, we see three random Keyblade wielders under the guidance of Master Ericus to protect the light, who is also Mark Hamill, by the way. With Xehanort being played by Leonard Nimoy, this is the Star Trek Star Wars crossover we've all been wanting. And these three are called Aqua, Ventus, and Terra. Extremely close friends, and all three of them have been spending a long ass time undergoing their Mark of Mastery exams that Riku and Sora had an emergency rushed version of in Dream Dot Distance. Meaning that the final part of their exam is pretty piss easy in comparison, but all of this fails to mean anything once the worlds are under threat and the seven princesses of heart from Kingdom Hearts 1 are apparently being attacked for some reason after Xehanort mysteriously just appears to witness the exams. This is just too coincidental. Meaning that in one way or another they all head out to solve the mystery and help each other out with three separate game campaigns that all cross over each other. I mean obviously I know the bad stuff is happening because of Master Xehanort and this game is the origin of his ridiculous scheme where it's eventually found out that he was all along trying to create his own version of the ultimate Keyblade spelt with an X by tempting the darkness out of Ventus for one half light and dark to clash together and forge a fake version of the Keyblade. What makes Ventus's darkness so special is never explained in the game, nor is it explained where Ventus even came from and why Xehanort was so interested in him specifically. But regardless, forcing Ventus into the situation didn't work to forge or materialise the ultimate Keyblade, leading him to improvise and grab Ventus's darkness straight from his own heart and create another being known as Vanitas, then leading to the existence of the not heartless enemy of the game known as Unversed, who feed off of the energy that Vanitas gives off. In a half improvised scheme, it turns out that Xehanort wants Vanitas and Ventus to actually clash together or at least he wants to give Ventus a reason to fight because he's kind of a pacifist against other living people, which he then is convinced will get them to merge together in a weird metaphysical sense and then make the Keyblade appear from that merging. Based on the Legends of the Keyblade War and how he's trying to get his own versions of Light and Darkness to merge together to create the Blade, which was split into Light and Darkness in the original battle, but this is going to be a fake one, so... After watching over all of the exams take place, Xehanort eventually disappears to bait our three heroes out to get them to turn against each other so he can destroy the only people that can stop him, hopefully open up and control Kingdom Hearts with his fake Keyblade he's trying to make, and then use one of the bodies of the wielders as a vessel for him to carry on into the rest of the series because he's an old man. But this is it in its simplest terms, because Birth by Sleep in classic Kingdom Hearts fashion is not afraid to go complicated, and even after all I know, I still have a few questions. Not only the origins of Ventus and what makes him so special, but apparently that's explained in the phone game, so screw you. But other things like, where did Xehanort get the Master of Masters Keyblade that Lushu took to the graveyard along with that weird chest? Was Lushu Xehanort Xehanort's master, or did Xehanort steal it? Can you steal Keyblades like that? And yes, after another chat with Super Butterbuns, the biggest Kingdom Hearts fan I know, she mentioned that once again, a lot of the stuff with Ventus is mentioned in the phone game, and even pointed out to me that Castle Oblivion from Chain of Memories is actually what happened when the Keyblade Master's University Grounds, the Land of Departure, was lost to the darkness later in the story, and kind of became it due to Aqua. She kind of opens it up and creates a safe haven for anyone lost in the darkness, yet because of the amount of power behind its creation, messes up most people that enter it, and furthermore, makes sense for organisations 13 to eventually take it over, since anyone looking for the light in the darkness would eventually walk right into their trap. Along with seeing the beginnings of Xehanort's scheme and how everything gets kicked off into Kingdom Hearts 1, it's also cool to see the beginnings of Maleficent and how she teamed up with the Heartless, Yen Sid and Mickey's relationship, and it's even nicer to see three new characters that unlike back cover, I actually gave a little bit of a shit about. I found their struggles entertaining and really appreciate how you get links from all three characters in the Sora saga of Kingdom Hearts. With Terra, you have this man who's desperate to become a Keyblade Master, yet is unable to fully control the darkness lurking in his 
far, which eventually leads him to fail multiple missions and allows him to become manipulated by slimy old Xehanort and distance himself from his friends who he suspects are spying on him because of this. He eventually ends up with the saddest conclusion of the trio as his body gets fully possessed by Xehanort, which explains why he looks so damn young in the Sora saga. Well, I mean the apprentice of Ansem the Wise Xehanort more specifically, the one that goes around calling himself Ansem. I can only assume that Yen Sid either didn't know who Master Xehanort was or didn't realise that Master Xehanort was inside Terra's body after he supposedly died and the only ones that would have known the truth about him were unable to warn him after the events of the game and what happens to all of the three main characters in this story, along with Mickey who probably didn't even realise what the hell was going on in general until much later in the Kingdom Hearts story. Terra is also responsible for Riku becoming a Keyblade Master since after visiting Destiny Islands he could sense the urge for adventure and true beaming light hiding inside him that would later get compromised so bequeathed the Keyblade to him. And this explains why everyone was telling Riku he was the original chosen one in Dream Drop Distance for the Keyblade. Thank you for explaining that. Aqua is the one of the group who ends up becoming the Keyblade Master from the Mark of Mastery and gets sent off by Ericus to get Ventus back from him running off after Terra and keep an eye on Terra who's looking for Master Xehanort. She not only accidentally bequeaths her Keyblade to a younger Kairi in her hometown of Radiant Garden while trying to protect her, but also intends to actually give her Keyblade to Sora, sensing how strong his bond is with Riku, yet decides not to in the end because she senses that Riku was already touched by another Keyblade Master, that sounds really wrong, and instead chooses to save him from the hardships of being a Keyblade Master, but does tell him to save Riku if he should ever fall to the darkness, which he does indeed do, and that's what ends up with him accidentally getting the Keyblade because there was no other option at that moment. She fails to save Ventus from a deep sleep that was caused by his dark clone Vanitas trying to reforge the fake Keyblade in the final boss moments of the game, and so, like I mentioned, gets his body and hides him in a newly forged Castle Oblivion ready for whenever he wakes up. But it's not that happy of an ending for Aqua either, since while trying to save Terra's possessed body and heart from being lost to the Realm of Darkness after a heated encounter, she ends up sacrificing herself to the darkness. And while that is very nice and noble and heroic, eventually this ends up causing that leak of heartless and darkness into the Realm of Light that Sora has to clean up and that gets exploited by Ansem, aka Terra Xehanort, and gets Riku taken over by the darkness in Kingdom Hearts 1. Ventus, on the other hand, is a special case. Since he started off originally as Master Xehanort's apprentice while he tried to tempt the darkness out of him by nearly killing him to try forging his own ultimate Keyblade, Vanitas gets created from him unlocking the darkness directly from his heart, but also knocks Ventus out and causes his heart to reach out to the nearest source of care and warmth that it could after Xehanort decided to take him to Destiny Islands to live out his last days in secret. His heart reaches out to another heart of the extremely young Sora, but that allows him to not only wake up briefly, but also grab a Keyblade out of the air. Xehanort, seeing the Keyblade materialise from Ventus, then decides to take him to Master Erika's with Terra and Aqua. And since Ventus has amnesia after all the shit he went through, it kind of makes sense that nobody would be suspecting anything. And then Xehanort ends up revealing his true purpose to forge the fake Ultimate Keyblade by fighting his dark self Vanitas, hence why Ericus never allowed him to leave just in case this should happen. He was just too stupid to realise that Xehanort was the one that was going to make the fake Keyblade in the first place. Unsurprisingly, Ventus gets pretty upset about all of this and after many developments has a pretty epic battle with Vanitas after he threatens the lives out of Aqua and Terra, weakening him to be combined with Vanitas and then leading into a metaphysical fight where the last part of Ventus' heart goes full on ape shit against the dark side of the new body wielding the fake Keyblade which destroys the fake Keyblade in the process, yet causes the deep sleep state that Aqua tries her hardest to solve but cannot. Oh my god, yeah, there is a lot to take in with three campaigns and crisscrossing paths but not only did I find myself enjoying it all but also appreciated all of my questions finally being answered from Dream Drop, specifically why Roxas looks identical to Ventus since Roxas is Sora's nobody after all and Ventus's heart does reside in Sora nice and safe based on how Ventus originally woke up in the first place. I'm assuming that Ventus is only awake for this particular game without his heart fully inside his body because Vanitas is the thing that's keeping him alive but I'm not 100% sure on that. Or maybe it's because he was able to wake up being so close to Sora in Destiny Islands and then once he loses his heart or ends up in a sleep again he has to be closer to Sora in order for him to wake up a second time but he can't do it this time because he's in a completely different area. I think that's what's going on and I think that's what Kingdom Hearts 3 is going to explain. I hope it does anyway. And of course in Dream Drop Distance we discover this hidden research data inside Sora that he has his heart of pure light touching everyone so hard that he is indeed the key to wake Ventus up that no one knows about yet and somehow the key to getting Aqua out of the darkness and Terra out of Xehanort's grasp. This is further backed up by the D-Link mechanic in the game not only allowing you to borrow friend abilities but also allowing the three friends to remain connected even in the deepest darkness hence they aren't all lost forever just yet. Sora is basically a hotel for lost hearts and he doesn't even realise it because of how pure he is as a being. I've got a newfound sympathy for the guy honestly. Speaking of Anson the Wise and his research too I also love how the game tackles the Organization 13 members while they were still human in Radiant Garden. All studying the aspects of the heart under Ansem the Wise and then starting to follow Terra Xehanort's controversial ideas eventually leading them to all banish Ansem to the darkness. Xehanort had everyone in the organization under wraps even before they became nobodies and then followed Xemnas without question and it also makes sense why Ansem the Wise coded his own research into Sora after he escaped 
escape the darkness hiding away as Diz. Not only did he need to hide from everybody to secure his safety, but he was slowly losing it after being banished to the darkness for so long. It was a failsafe. And hey, Asura has everybody's heart inside of him already. What's more data gonna have? The main problem I have with this plot point is that if Ansem the Wise was busy hiding all of this shit inside Sora along with everybody's wandering heart, that's fine. But if code had never happened in the future, Mickey would never have found out about anything that was crucial to the events of kicking off Dream Drop Distance and Kingdom Hearts 3. What I want to know is why didn't Ansem the Wise just tell Mickey some of these things and have it inside Sora as a backup? Sora is just as likely to die as Mickey is, and if Mickey never dived into the data Sora nonsense and found out this vital stuff about Ventus, Terra, and Aqua, Dream Drop and 3 would potentially never happen and the world could potentially end. Screw this story, I have a headache! And so finally, I can get around to talking about the gameplay, thank god. And luckily, it's so similar in many ways to multiple games I've covered in the past with this review series, so aside from a few glaring differences, I don't have to explain much more over what you're seeing. Like I said, you have three different campaigns to play through with each character, all favouring different gameplay styles and approaches to combat. Through these campaigns, you explore even more Disney realms from Lilo and Stitch to Disney Town itself, and particularly from the Princess of Heart realms as you try to save them, like Cinderella's Castle, Snow White's Forest, and Sleeping Beauty's Dungeon, how morbid. You also go back to old places like Olympus all over again, with the same exact areas aside from one extra square room and Hercules being all skinny, that's the only difference, snore. At least Neverland is totally different from every other game since you actually go to the wilds of it, so that's pretty cool. Does this mean you visit every world with every character on repeated playthroughs? Yes it does, but it's not as excessive as you may think it sounds. You don't only get moments in each world where you explore totally different parts of the world for a unique experience with its own character quests and boss battles, but repetition is mitigated a fair amount by all the separate story beats and cutscenes along with the fact that the campaigns on average lasted me about 10 hours or less each, which is not too long for an action RPG. And the Disney world you explore come and go so quickly you won't even realise how long you've been playing it for. It's impressive for a PSP game especially, and I'm playing this as a PS4 console game. It works as both, for its scale as a console game, and yet the faster pace despite the scale for a portable system. What also helps is that everything that makes Kingdom Hearts games mechanics so fun and tinkerable is here and accounted for. As you play, you unlock more platforming and attack abilities to add to your moveset that can sometimes even add on to more of your previous abilities to make them more effective. You have incentives to play carefully when you've leveled up your character enough to have access to those necessary abilities, like with counter-attacks after blocks. You've got magic that has ranged and close quarter uses alike. You find treasure chests hidden away that contain not only consumables, but even permanent abilities that are often locked out until you have other abilities. You have some of the most creative bosses in the Kingdom Hearts universe to date with brief elements of puzzle solving mixed in with a good amount of parrying and dodging, and with the ending encounter specifically, even some of the trickier bosses, unless you know how to read extremely fast and punishing moves, or can exploit the boss's behaviours by goading them into attacking you. To fight these bosses and every other enemy though, you are given, in my opinion, the coolest combat so far in Kingdom Hearts. Maybe not the best, and like I've seen from a few Let's Plays, probably the most breakable that isn't Chain of Memories, but the most experimental and stylish for sure. Not only because you get completely different movesets with their own strengths and weaknesses for each campaign, with Terra focusing on slow brute strength, Aqua focusing on magic, and Ventus having a middle ground with lots of speed to make up for his slightly weaker blows, but it rewards offense and getting stuck into fights like no other Kingdom Hearts game. Like Dream Drop, you have basic attacks and combos along with a looping deck with cooldowns for every other special move and magic attack, but here, the more you use specific kinds of attacks during combos, not only the faster you level up, but you'll charge up a specific ultra finishing combo set that differs in range, damage and effectiveness with elemental abilities, all based on what attacks you chose to focus on in that moment. Some of these finishers can also transform your loadout and further increase your flashy attacks, and then if you're constantly aggressive with attacks without taking too much damage to break the chain, you will eventually be rewarded with an insane ultra powerful finishing move once the meter is charged yet again. But this amount of power has the cost of the charge meter going down really quickly, hence the emphasis on more action being rewarded. And you can revert back to a normal state after only a few seconds. With all the different magic attacks and special moves to swap between in your deck, the game is always changing and gives you more cause to think about what finishes and transformative combo modes you need to use depending on the type of enemies around you, instead of just letting you win mashing the attack button like with Kingdom Hearts 1, which is remarkable due to how melee heavy this system can be. You can even cheat a little bit and rely on nothing but basic attacks to build up the meter and then finish off charging the meter with a specific special move or magic attack to activate a specific finisher that you were looking to activate. You reap the rewards whatever you choose to do, and I ended up swapping Keyblades around more than any other game because the stats actually felt like they affected my playstyle based on the command cards I had in my deck and the finishers that I was trying to activate. Not like the other Kingdom Hearts games when usually the most recent Keyblade you got is the most powerful at that time. And that's not all, you also get access to what the game calls D-Links that I mentioned in the plot summary earlier, where you can temporarily take abilities from other characters you meet in the game and get access to even more moves, combos, finishers with their own uses, and the chance to level up the ones that you use more than others in order to grab some of the most devastating moves in the game. Some D-Links even have passive abilities like occasional auto 
guarding, occasional teleporting behind enemies, and in Mickey's case, constant double XP while activated, which is so amazingly useful if you head for a higher leveled area before the recommended level. It's very rock, paper, scissors, and it sounds like I'm making it seem too easy, but blocking and dodging is still very important in this game, probably the most important, and enemy types and numbers are upped significantly from the start compared to the start of Kingdom Hearts 1, 2, or even Dream Drop Distance. And your attack strings and finisher meter building can be interrupted more than you'd like if you don't think about what's going on around you. There's so much to work with here to keep the odds in your favour, however what balances it all out is the glass cannon nature of the game, like with the amount of health you end up with by the end of the game being pitiful compared to what you'll be used to seeing in 1 or 2. And restoring your health in a reliable amount is only possible if you replace vital powerful moves in your deck with the chance to heal on top of more chances to heal. And when I say that I mean that one slot in your command deck can only carry like I think it's 4 or 5 potions at a time just for an example. It's a bit limited in that regard and I think it works for how powerful the game can make you, just get ready to die a lot if you choose brawn over recovery. I haven't even mentioned the return of shops and synthesis menus where you can take a risk with copies of moves and magic you already own to unlock new special deck moves, but also add in other special items to give you constant passive abilities while you have that move like damage or health boost. Combining that with the shop system and buying more copies of moves to create more moves that you'll be able to use over and over again while others are cooling down and things can get totally hectic, which is balanced once again by some of the synthesized items being unknown, so mixing together two of your most powerful moves could potentially waste them or get you one of the best moves in the game, you never know. And hey, if you think there's a little bit too much action going on, there are also some replayable minigames in the same vein as the 100 Acre Wood, but instead you're in Disney Town, and there's not only a decent variety with decent execution, but all come with their own special rewards. There's a volley game that I'm completely boss at, a rhythm-based Simon Says game that I'm also completely boss at. It's a nice distraction and a little bit more intense than what Winnie the Turd over here can offer. Oh yeah, I nearly forgot, there's also this new Shot Lock addition to Combat 2, which is like Dead Eye in Red Dead Redemption, but in real time, with brief invincibility once you activate the attack itself after locking onto the targets that you need. Personally, I only really used one of them once I unlocked it, the Lightning one, for the small amount of projectiles you need to lock on so it can be activated nice and fast. And it had its uses for me, especially in a handful of bosses where the quick lock on and brief invincibility were a lifesaver on occasion once the attack was activated, but it wasn't something I ever relied on, even with the finishes they all had requiring a full lock on chain before you activate them. Now where the main aspect of the gameplay is as solid as a steel capped boot, there is one other part that is just odd. Not as completely out of place as the creature care in Dream Drop, but it's still pretty weird. Did you ever want to play Mario Party mixed with Monopoly in a Kingdom Hearts game? Because like it or lump it, it's in this game, and it's yet another way to upgrade brand new attacks to acquire. Now this, I just do not understand. Not the game itself, but the concept of it. What you have here is a game that relies heavily on chance, but in some cases is required to not only upgrade attacks, but also unlock other moves as well. And these aren't quick games, these are basically Monopoly. It takes a long ass time. I mean, yeah, the animal care in Dream Drop Distance was tedious after a long time, but you could at least jump in and out of it despite the compulsory nature of it. What's odd about it though is that in the same breath, if you're okay with not upgrading things quickly and missing out on some great early game rewards, then this board game isn't actually that compulsory either, it's just heavily, heavily suggested that you do it. But either way, this is a lot more complicated and time consuming than just petting and feeding animals. Here, games of this can last so long that you even have the choice to suspend them, and whether you enjoy the game or not, which I do to an extent, I thought this was a fun game. Game. I enjoyed it more than the creature care at least. The amount of time you put into this is never really worth the rewards you get from it even though the rewards can be really good. You can always just upgrade and unlock things by playing the game naturally and using those very same attacks but your punishment is missing out on some really valuable and useful stuff including those additional permanent benefits from extra health to more effective potions and shorter cooldowns but again this is still a board game and left a lot up to chance when you aren't strategizing where to invest your money. Personally I only got away with touching this game around six times in total and managed to beat the campaigns just fine on standard mode without it that much. It's so weird, it's as important as it is unimportant at the same time, so it just makes me wonder what the real point was including it in the first place, especially on a PSP where the game can last a long old time. And even more perplexing is that you can always choose to kill the flow of a Disney world by entering a board game at any save point, or you can just wait half an hour max until you're out of the Disney world, go to the arena on the main map screen and then play the same game via there where you don't only get the same benefits but also additional medals to win that you can spend via the
the arena shot that gets you even more rewards only available through the arena. Why wouldn't you do this? Why is playing from the save menu even an option? And why does the game tell you to do that and not recommend you do it from the arena? Plus, if you go to the arena, you can always break up that with a bit of kart racing, which is no crash team racing or anything I'm aware and incredibly herky-jerky, but it's still fun enough and it gets you more medals to spend. Without a doubt, though, the worst thing about Birth by Sleep to me, despite how much I enjoyed it, was the process of unlocking the true ending. The game doesn't give you a single clue on how to do this, aside from the difficulty options hinting at it being slightly harder to unlock the true ending the easier the difficulty you choose, but it explains nothing else. Then the game boots up and you're told to just beat all three campaigns to unlock the true ending, so that's what I did, and nothing happened. What I later discovered is that I needed to beat the game on proud mode in order to grab the true ending, or if on standard mode like I was, find every single Xehanort report and hidden sticker in the game along with finish the story. I found all the Xehanort reports no issue because they were just kind of there, but finding the stickers I didn't do that, I didn't realise they were that important, and at that point I realised I had three completely broken individual saves that I couldn't go back through and complete 100% because the game heavily advised me to save on completion of every story once I finished it. So yeah, screw that noise, I'm not going through all of that again at a harder difficulty, I looked it up on YouTube and that's how I know about the final fates of the characters in Birth by Sleep, by cheating, and I don't care about that because I felt like the game cheated me a little bit. Keep this in mind if you ever plan to play this game everyone, because the game will show you no mercy. That aside though, overall I did love Birth by Sleep and until I finished off my series of reviews of Kingdom Hearts with a fragmentary passage, I feel more in depth with the lore than I ever have done until this point. It's not only an essential part of the story, but an essential game in general to experience in the Kingdom Hearts saga, especially over Dream Drop Distance, which I thought was really good, but not as solidly constructed as this, and much more experimental with combat to help stave off any repetition. It speaks volumes that this game with three characters going to the same places is that much more fun to play against Dream Drop Distance that ends up having three running attacks and only two characters to flip-flop between, and a much smaller side game stapled onto it despite it being much more straightforward. For all of its iffy moments, Birth by Sleep actually manages to execute what it sets out to do pretty damn well. And all of this doesn't only make me excited for the prospects of Kingdom Hearts 3, but equally fragmentary passage for as short as that may be, so until next time, get ready for what will hopefully be the closest thing to 3's gameplay and graphics we'll have so far, and get ready for the final Kingdom Hearts review in my totally exhausting series. If it's your birthday today while watching this video, happy freaking birthday to you, and please remember to stay- I'm dying. <laughs> Hey everyone, thank you again for sticking with me until the very end of this video. I know it's becoming a bit of a mouthful. I'm starting to regret coming back into video making after a while by doing Kingdom Hearts videos. They are so bloody complicated and so tossing all over the place that it's... I can't even figure out... What? Anyway, the Kingdom Hearts Saga, the, the review video marathon, is nearly done. So thank you so much for sticking with me while that's happening. The, again, like I said, the next Catechorus is still being worked on. I just need to do Fragmentary Passage, and then we're back into Catechorus. So it's not going to be too long of a wait now, guys, okay? It could be next Saturday. So yeah, stay tuned for that. Thank you so much to every single person on the screen right now who have supported me via Patreon. And special, special thanks to the top tier supporters for December. Omama2, Basil, Carl Hakkinen, Gamer Man, I Have a Portal Gun, Exopaz, Matthew Hubble, Mills Kahai, Brandon Brandon, Binary Code, Kirsten B, Cyberpunk Symphony, Nicole Ganara, Nathan Young, Victor Patrick Bauer, Robert Alamsha, The Game Shed, Daniel Leon, Braden Kenny, Jake Delahaye 2008, Mitchell Reed, A.D. Thornton Smith, and Maximilian Ely. Thank you so much, every single one of you amazing people.